The International Blind Cafe 18 Plus presents Conversations from Booth 6. This episode is brought to you by Dots 1 5. Order up. This one for Booth 6? Yep. Welcome back to Booth 6 here at the International Blind Cafe. Recreation and hobbies are life-enriching activities that promote relaxation and wellness. Some are socially driven, while others are creative or nature-based. The blind community engages in many different pastimes, most of which are adapted to suit our own individual needs and make those activities more accessible. Jason, what activities do you hear from members that they like to participate in? Well, Scout, you said it. We we as blind people really need to fill our, our spare time. So we do that like any other guy. We all have hobbies. We like to go fishing. We like to... Some of us like to go golfing, camping, ride recreational vehicles. We're, we're no different than any, any other guy that way. And, and tonight, the uh, guys here in the, in the booth are here to share some of their stories. In fact, presently, right now, Dion is out there in rural Newfoundland at a cabin, maybe deep in the woods, maybe not. But hey, Dion, what are your plans for this weekend out there in, in Newfoundland? Well, I tell you now, Jason and I uh, just got here today. It was a busy weekend in town, but uh, came to the cottage this weekend. And uh, oddly enough, uh, obviously I, I can't drive, but I got access to an ATV. And uh, I had a friend of mine that could drive. And uh, we just came back from like a 45 minute ride. Uh, like I said, because you're low vision or blind, I mean, you can enjoy that kind of stuff. I do it all the time. Uh, I've been lucky enough to have access to it, but uh, obviously everybody don't. But uh, I love to do what I can. And uh, if I got people around to support me in that initiative or any other, uh, I, I feel very privileged. And uh, I usually initiate it. I was like, okay, come on, let's go to the cabin. I got access to, I got, luckily enough, I got access to a cabin and stuff. And uh, very rarely do I have any issues uh, trying to find someone to um, accompany me, I guess, and uh, to the cottage and do what I want to do. Oh, absolutely. And uh, when my son's willing, I love to go for a rip on the quad. I like you, he gets to drive, but. It's still fun sitting on the back and and getting to feel the bugs coming through your teeth and the grass against your, your skins and yeah, it's a good time. I, I really enjoy quadding with my son. So absolutely, Christopher, you yes, by by circumstance just came back from a week at the infamous CNIB camp at, at St. Joe, which is a wonderful facility located in Ontario. Yes, I did. Tell us a little bit about your week at, at Camp Joe. This is um, a camp located in uh, Muskoka Region, Central Ontario. It's located on the shore of Lake Joseph, a freshwater lake, one of three Muskoka lakes. It has staff of people who have uh, partial visual impairments. So they have some idea how you know how to you know help those of us visitors to the camp who are visually impaired or blind. But during my visit there this this year. I tried for the first time in my life the um, the tandem biking. The first time I'd been on a tandem bike in my life, and it's like, oh, crikey's man! I hope I don't fall off. But the staff were great in keeping me upright and off the ground. But that was fun. We had the open fire, open fire campfire twice this week. That was a great fun. It's like I felt like a twelve year old kid again, roasting marshmallows around the campfire. Um, last year, I was at the same camp. Tried the climbing wall. They have a climbing wall with three separate difficulty levels. Tried that, and 
uh, that was a, quite the experience. They had um, just holy events. They had the, the uh, tactile soccer field where you can feel where you're on the field or off field. They had the shuffleboard. They have an archery, which I did not uh, quite get the uh, bravery to try. Uh, they have shuffleboard. They have water skiing. They have tubing. Neither of which I was brave enough to try, but. It's just uh, the the whole camp, all the activities they offer there, the uh, just a whole bunch of fun stuff that you do typically at, at any campsite. Um, but it's a great time had by all, I think. Maybe someday when you get enough experience, they'll let you steer the tandem bike. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be a fun thought, wouldn't it? I don't know if they'd enjoy their bike ending up in the ditch, but... Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> and... and and how about you, Jody? You, you, you're participating and have participated for several years, I understand, in, in dragon boat race. Tell us about you and your dragon boat race. That sounds amazing. Well, first to start off, I need to explain what dragon boating is. Uh, it's basically a long boat with 20 paddlers. That's 10 rows of two people. 10 on the left, 10 on the right, with one person in the front to drum and one person in the back to uh, steer the boat. Now, for me personally, it's been, this is probably my fourth team. Uh, I did one competitive uh, team uh, many years ago, and then I did two uh, community teams, and then I retired for about eight years. Um, When I was going through uh, the early uh, period of O&M, um, I was being brought around the Montreal Association for Blind, the rehabilitation center that I was associated with. Um, she was showing me around different uh, things like uh, assistive technology that just to see what would help or not. And uh, towards the end of the tour, she sort of threw out there that she's the captain of uh, a Dragon Ball team. Instantly, my ears perked up and said, you know, I've done this many, many years. If you need a paddler, I'll be there for you. And two years later, um, the call came in. Um, The team, it's called the Caravella, uh, based out of Montreal. And uh, literally about two-thirds of the team has some form of visual impairment from RP to light perception to fully blind with guide dogs. Um, A lot of them have been recruited out of the uh, Montreal Association for the Blind. We do, uh, we do pretty good. Uh, We're, we're very um, enthusiastic. Let's put it that. And uh, a lot of people coming in to try out and everybody's welcome really. And, um, this will be my fourth year with the team. Um, we have a, one competition coming up in about uh, two weeks. That should be good. Because uh, last year, somehow we lucked out with a medal uh, last year. That's excellent. Yeah. I hope they don't let the guide dog steer the boat, though. Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> okay, they like to get wet, so they get to stay in the cabin while we practice. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Dion, as we were kind of warming up for 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 this today, you mentioned that you you've also you've also ridden the tandem bike. Yeah, actually, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Fighting Blindness Canada uh, went and put a challenge out there a few years ago, and uh, my sister that actually lives in Sweden came over and she signed us up. I didn't want no part of it. And it was a tandem bike ride. I never rode a tandem bike. She never rode a tandem bike. And uh, so basically we went there and we had to pick out a bike. And there was this one that was there called uh, Old Nelly. Now this is an old tandem bike that got chrome fenders. Steel bike is not carbon fiber or none of that kind of stuff. So we we, <laughs> we jumped aboard this bike. And uh, for the first, I'd say... 12 feet, 15 feet, we couldn't even get moving. But then when we got used to it, uh, she was very good with direction. She told me, right, okay, we're going to come to a left turn or we're going to slow down or whatever it was. I was on the back, obviously. And um, 
yeah, we uh, we went 25 kilometers uh, up and back uh, on a flat trail, what used to be the old uh, rail bed here in Newfoundland, Labrador, but it's, uh, they took the tracks up in 1982, so now it's basically a, a, a grass province trail. So that's what we rode on and stuff, and we had to cross a few streets, and uh, yeah, we raised 2,200 bucks for the cars, and uh, yeah, we didn't never file down. It was uh, it was awesome. That sounds like quite the adventure. I I've never been brave enough to jump on a on a tandem bike, but listening to you guys, that sounds like it, it might be worth the adventure. Besides anything chrome, I'm an old truck driver, so chrome is uh, chrome. Chrome's the ticket as far as I'm concerned. Mm. So. So when you're not up at Camp Joe, Christopher, yes, I hear I hear you like to wander around in the backwoods. Yes, sir. The um, having grown up in the big city of Toronto from 1970 until late 1995, I moved to St. Catharines in '96. The house that my apartment is located in is in the back, back behind the backyard, is the wooded area with the ravine. There's uh, two streets, to, one to my west, one to my east, and quite often I would go out through the backwoods. There's a shortcut to get to one, two streets to my west or east. I discovered that, you know, it's nice back here. It's nicer than being out in the street, you know, walking along sidewalks. And now that I've lost my sight, I found I know where I used to walk. I can remember it. I know all the landmarks. I can find the ravine. I can find the footbridge. And I've had people ask me, how the heck do you navigate blind in the forest? I think, well, I've been there before. I know the mechanics, the muscle memory of where I am, how to get back. But I found following a fence, I can figure out direction. I can hear the sound of the highway to my east, highway number 406. I can hear the schoolyard that's just to my west. I can hear the school bell. I can feel the sun, the warmth of the sun, and I the left or right side of my face, knowing the time of day. I can figure out which direction I'm facing based on the sounds or the feeling the sun on my face I can figure out where I am based on okay which tree did I just walk into whose fence did I just walk past but it's just being out in, this, in the backwoods I just hear the sound of the, the birds the occasion of the deer walking through the forest floor quietly as their hooves go through the, the undergrowth the leaves on the, on the forest floor but I guess the only thing I have to worry about are the damn mosquitoes but it's just a peaceful place to be. In, in Japan, I hear they have a tradition in Japan, what they call Shin Rin Yoku, forest bathing, just walking through the forest in the quiet peace of forest. Just the sounds, the nature of being out in the forest, just forest bathing, walking with nature. And it's just, it somehow calms the mind. And I find that for me when I'm out in the backwoods wandering around. I might get lost or turn around for a bit and I'll always find my way back, but it's just like I come back feeling like I've just come back from a really good long nap. It gets me away from the noise of traffic and the noise of city life. I'm just out in the backwoods, the quiet peace of being out in the woods. Nothing beats it in my opinion. Yeah, I know exactly what you're saying, uh, Chris, because I tell you, like I said, I'm at the cabin here now. Yeah, yep. Yeah. I'm really glad that I got saw reception and... Um, but it's the same here. Like I, I always say up here, the silence is deadening. There's a little breeze of wind. Other than that, there's absolutely no sound here uh, unless you turn on your TV or your radio. And uh, no, it's uh, it's very, very, very relaxing. Somehow helps restore the soul and settles the mind. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so Jody, what, what what else would do you do that's outside of the box recreation wise? Is there any uh, anything you like to do before we get into some of the more organized recreational stuff that we can talk about? Well, besides uh, besides the Dragon Bolt, uh, the last couple of years, the only thing I've really done was just my walk around the neighborhood. My neighborhood, one loop around my neighborhood is exactly two kilometers. So during lockdowns, when everybody was afraid to be anywhere near each other, I was outside in my neighborhood walking around every day. Absolutely. It's great to get outside and walk, whether it's in an urban area or a rural area, because I do a little bit of both. Like Chris, you said, out walking in the backwoods or Dion too, like just being outside and walking, it's the best thing for you. 
Um, but but I do know, and I haven't I haven't participated in a lot of it. But there's actually a lot of blind adaptive sports out there. There's one that's big in the blind community, and that's go ball. I know a little bit about it, but I do know that it's a Paralympic sport. But it's a big ball, and they play on their knees, and they pass this ball back and forth to each other and try and score. Um, what do any any one of you guys know about go ball? I do. I do say uh, it's like an audible. You get an audible sound to locate the ball. So I think. Uh, being audible, I think it's very important for uh, a lot of these uh, type of sports because my team, whereas fully sighted teams, they just follow the person in front of them. Uh, we need like an audible counting out loud for everybody to be able to hit the water at exactly the same time. Like one, two, one, two. So yeah. audible uh, is, the, is the way to go for any of these um, teams and port yeah there's a, a, a there's a a, a, a guy that I know Brandon Snow uh, that was uh, a part of the blonde hockey team mm. that's from Newfoundland Labrador um, and it's the same thing with that I mean they play hockey same as everybody else plays hockey with the equipment and that kind of stuff but uh, the puck is bigger and it also got like say like rattles so it's audible in order to know where to obviously and same with the goldie obviously the goldie is blind or low vision whatever and uh, yeah I agree with Jody everything as it relates to recreation that kind of thing should be audible I've never been familiar with the uh, ball sport that Jason had mentioned but I do recall last year uh, my first year at the camp, Lake Joseph, they mentioned they had the soccer pitch that was um, adjusted for blind uh, players. They mentioned uh, the soccer ball that they use has some sort of like a rattle or sort of mechanism that when the ball is kicked or moved, it makes a noise so you can keep track of where the ball, where in the field the ball is. The soccer pitch they use is artificial turf, but the border around the perimeter of the soccer pitch is a different texture than the actual soccer yeah. field itself. So that when you, if you go off the field, you can feel the difference in the texture. So that you can feel, okay, I'm off the field. I need to get back on the field. Or I'm on the field. I need to get back offside until I'm called back to play. Um, they have also at this camp the uh, basketball court. It's the same issue with the basketball. It has some sort of sound, like a rattle or some other sound generating device that you can hear where the ball is if someone else has it aside from hearing it bouncing obviously but it's like the other two are saying it's you need as a blind person you need an audible cue as to where in space the puck or the ball is relative to where you the player is yeah, yeah. well when it comes back to the hockey there i also heard the, the puck is actually heel full of ball bearings and the net is half the height you can't raise that puck off the ice, definitely. Not even feel, not even a, a traditional puck. Because it would just knock everybody's teeth out. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. The things we do, there's, there's adaptive tennis, adaptive uh, golf. And I still like to whack a golf ball around, but I'm not finding the golf ball. So I don't know how, how they're doing that in the blind community, but they're doing it. And that's, that's the amazing the amazing part of it but i know dion you went on a fishing trip this winter how, how did that how did that go oh that was awesome i uh flew from here to uh labrador and uh then we were on a small plane from there to a lodge and then after that it was uh other skidoos or walking or flying we flew once again to another part of the island and uh yeah it was awesome lucky enough i like i said i had the opportunity to go with friends of mine that knew that i had low vision and uh they were really accommodating and uh, normally a lot of people would say no i'm not going at it but for me i uh, very rarely 
refuse anything. Actually, I'm going to Halifax next week just to visit some friends of mine uh, for four or five days. And uh, yeah, I just I just think you got to have a supports and uh, a good attitude. And you can't let your vision slow you down. It will. Uh, it's not going to allow you to do everything, obviously. But uh, if you got the right attitude to do these things and uh, not be intimidated, then, like I said, you got to have a lot of good supports with you, whether it's your friends or family, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, I'd, uh, I, I refuse to let it stop me from doing anything. Well, that, that's definitely where I find it. If, if someone hasn't made it accessible already, especially when it comes to just goofing around and, and recreation, it's easy to find a workaround and, and make it happen. Like, like I said, I'll go stand in the backyard with my own golf clubs and the traditional golf balls and I'll whack it into the tree line. And then, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'll go groping through there looking for golf balls, but I, I never find nearly as many as I whacked into the tree line. <laughs> no, I wouldn't so, say. <clears throat> so I, I don't buy the expensive golf balls anymore. I go to go to a store where they they sell bags of used golf balls balls that have been retrieved by wherever out of the ponds on golf course or whatever i don't know where they get them from but it's a mixed bag of used golf balls that are in decent shape they're practice balls that's all they are and yeah i whack at those for an hour or two and i get to feel like i went golfing without dragging my butt through an 18 hole course (laughs) <laughs> um, it's all about trying it out you don't know you can't do anything until you try it you know you never you just might surprise yourself oh yeah. well, absolutely it, we're the only we're the only ones that can hold ourselves back Not nobody's holding us back if, if they say oh you're blind you can't do it right here what's how's the old saying go hold, hold, here hold my beer you don't know you can't do something unless you've tried it and as people see the white cane, they're just shocked that you can actually do something. They, they expect, you know, uh, you're just going to sit there and listen to the TV. And, but then you go out and do stuff and the people are just, well, they're supportive after they get a uh, surprise. Well, I'll tell For you, sure. uh, on uh, Saturday night, I, uh, I met a, a lady and her husband through, actually, uh, I met them online. Just through a, a, a mutual phone call, same as same as Discord or uh, uh, the IBC, and uh, she said, "Well, uh, we're going to Newfoundland. I want to meet you." So this past Saturday night, last night, we uh, went down to uh, a, a local pub, met her and her friend and her two husbands with their guide dogs. Uh, they come from Ontario. And uh, the the bar owners and ser- uh, servers were second to none. They made sure we were accommodated. They were normally a lot of people will feel uncomfortable, right? Because it feels like they're being a burden or tormenting or whatever. But I mean, we were paying customers, and uh, I can tell you, the service at Kelly's Pub here in St. John's on George Street was second to none. They, like, there was a, there was, they were coming out every, almost too often, just to make sure everything was okay, and if you needed anything, or you wanted this, or you wanted that, and uh, if we had a, a, an, an additional account, or a accommodation that we were looking for, say for example, extra napkins, or this or that, they were only happy to oblige us, and uh, like I said, like like Jody was saying, you got to try it, and uh, you just got to be comfortable asking people to say, "Hey, look, there was there were two guide dogs there, and four people that were blind, and the servers knew that, and they were second to none. I can guarantee you, absolutely fantastic. That's the whole thing is." In order, in order to be seen, we've got to be out there to be seen, and then we've got to quit being invisible. Get out there, do stuff. Nothing stopping us, but uh, 
If you'd like to join us, there's always a seat for you in booth six at the International Blind Cafe, Discord server, and Facebook group.